Welcome to Navajo Wars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Thursday, November 17th, 2016. Here are our top stories. Tonight, they lost the election and they lost all credibility. And now they are losing their freaking minds. The mainstream media is in total panic mode and they are fighting to censor alt-right independent news. Then, illegal immigrants nationwide are demanding that Barack Obama issue mass pardons before Donald Trump takes over as president. Meanwhile, there is a growing movement by the left to challenge the Electoral College and strip Donald Trump of his presidency. To introduce to you the president-elect of the United States of America, Donald Trump. Yeah, good luck with that. All that plus Jesse Jackson wants Obama to pardon Hillary. That's up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Well, Obama is a lame duck now, and he's going across Europe squawking as he craps out more regulations here in the United States. And we're going to take a look at these two things. But remember, it was just two days ago that Obama was in Greece. And there he was warning against what he called a crude sort of nationalism that he said was taking root in the United States. In Athens, President Obama warned to guard against a rise in a crude sort of nationalism or ethnic identity or tribalism. This is from the guy who has pushed tribalism over individualism as a political tactic. This is their tactic, so certainly he understands that. Understand when they talk about diversity, you really need to break that down. I think that it's really kind of a collection, the way the Democrats use it, of division and diversion. That's what diversity is. That's what they mean when they say diversity. They don't want to divide us into competing groups because it makes it easier for them to win elections. It makes it easier for them to govern us. And they even pushed back against Oprah Winfrey. Before the election, if you remember, uh, of course, she's gotten in trouble since then by saying, hey, let's give uh, Trump a bit of a chance. And boy, she got hammered on social media. But before that, she got hammered for saying, I don't like the term diversity. It sounds a little bit much like division. Let's talk about inclusiveness. That, that would be a way to approach it, right? Let's talk about individualism. Let's talk about treating people as if they were individuals instead of members of a group. And that really is the source of this angst that we see uh, with the uh, millennials across the country. But he goes on to say, uh, the things that separate us ultimately lead us into conflict. Yes, he knows that. That's precisely why he did it. He said in the United States, we know what happens when we start dividing ourselves along the lines of race or religious uh, or religion or ethnicity. Yeah, we know what exactly what happens. Democrats get elected. <laughs> That's why they keep doing it. They divide us along the lines of ethnicity, religion, and other aspects into groups so they can get elected. Now, today, he's issuing even more warnings. And there's another headline from another article by the Washington Post. After the Trump win, Obama warns against taking democracy for granted. Now he's gone to Germany. And I think it's kind of interesting that he didn't start talking about taking democracy for granted in Greece. Why is that? We've seen the European Union depose not only a democratically elected uh, prime minister in Italy and replace him with a Goldman Sachs banker, but they did the same thing in Greece as well. And remember, it was Nigel Farage, that famous speech where he went to the EU and he talked to uh, Herman von Rompuy and he said, who are you? You have the demeanor of a third-rate bank clerk. You have deposed the democratically elected leader and the country that invented democracy, Greece. So Obama waits a couple of days before he starts talking about the legacy of democracy. He didn't do that in Athens. I guess the hypocrisy would have been a bit too much for the people there. But now that he's in Germany and standing with Merkel, he talks about democracy. And the Washington Post reports that he has wrapped up his final visit, his goodbye tour to Europe. Yes, he's going to have to start paying for his own vacations pretty soon, as well as his own golfing trips. Uh, he wrapped it up today, Thursday, and he warned Western democracies again not to take for granted our system of government and our way of life. No, we don't take that for granted, Obama. That's why we did not elect your successor who was going to continue your policies of destroying our democracy, of destroying our society that we've built in the West. We understand that this was a weaponized attack. That's what globalism is. He says and he continues to talk about uh, transatlantic cooperation. And it's interesting in this article that the Washington Post will mention several times 
that the two leaders never mentioned Donald Trump by name, but they said this, critical of the future in America. And they said this again, but they didn't mention Trump by name. They mentioned that over and over again, just so you know that uh, they're talking about Donald Trump as if you couldn't figure it out. And that's the Washington Post still leading the opposition. They go on to say the two leaders never mentioned him by name, but then they go on to defend the trifecta of globalism. They talk about refugees and how we have to keep that going. They talk about sharing a joint responsibility to protect and preserve our way of life while they try to destroy it by these tactics. They argue strongly in favor of pursuing a free trade deal. They herald the Paris Agreement to cut global emissions. So there's the three aspects of it. The refugees, the open borders, that's one part of it. The second part, of course, is the trade agreements. The third part is the climate treaty. Those are the three things that they can't stand about Donald Trump. And that is the essence of nationalism versus globalism. Those are the three legs of the uh, instrument, if you will, that it's been uh, designed to take down the West, to destroy our culture, our society, our way of life, our rule of law, even to erase our national borders as they then establish on the ruins that they create a new economic order that they control. They pick the winners, they pick the losers, they control all of this with their globalist treaties that they already wrote with the multinational corporations. And they can also fund a global governance uh, with a, a worldwide crisis that they invent and a worldwide tax and redistribution of wealth. Now, at the same time, as I point out, the lame duck Obama is squawking across Europe. He is basically <laughs> uh, crapping out regulations here, or as General Patton said in the uh, movie where George C. Scott did, uh, faster than shit out of a goose. We've got Obama setting a new record for regulations, 527 pages in just a single day, just one day. And this Washington Examiner piece points out that President Obama has just set a new record for rules and regulations. His administration putting out 527 pages in a single day as he races to put his fingerprint on virtually every corner of American life and business. And that's the issue, folks. That is the essence of this pervasive tyranny that is being sold to us by the elite of both parties. And let's hope that Donald Trump doesn't buy into this, that Donald Trump doesn't think that every problem that we have needs to be solved in Washington. As I pointed out yesterday, I'm very concerned about the trillion dollar infrastructure process that Donald Trump is doing. That's not his concern. He really doesn't need to worry about building our roads and bridges. We don't need to have those decisions made centrally in Washington. We get bridges to nowhere when we do that sort of thing. We get massive boondoggles. We get crony capitalism. We get in, uh, multinational corporations taking over our infrastructure and owning it and then turning us into serfs who have to rent our roads from them, who have to rent our bridges from them, who have to rent everything else from them because they will own everything. We don't need that. What we need from a Donald Trump presidency is the massive tax cut that he has proposed, bigger than Reagan did, which was bigger than what JFK did. We saw the positive effects of both of those things. And then he needs to get out of the way and let us at the state and local level, with the money that Washington did not take from us, use that money to build the infrastructure that we want in our cities and in our states. Do that locally. The more, we can, the more locally we can keep that, uh, then the better we will be if they pull that into Washington. That will enhance the corruption because no matter how many election reform laws you put in, as long as you have that money and power concentrated in Washington, you will draw in the corruption because people will be naturally drawn to it and the crooks will be drawn to that money and that power in Washington. So it's not his job to build our infrastructure and we don't want it being owned by foreign multinational corporations. But going back to the regulations that Obama is taking us with, the Competitive Enterprise Institute says the administration has just shattered the old record for pages of regulations. Uh, 81,000 total pages that they have produced now in 2016. And they still have 26 working days left. They said it's astonishing that they have set a new record and we're not even close to Thanksgiving. We're still a couple of weeks from, close, uh, from Thanksgiving. They said at a pace of well over 1,000 new pages each week of federal regulations. Think about that. The minutia. I mean, you, we have... The federal government telling us we can no longer decide that we're going to have male and female restrooms, for example. That's, that's one example of how they get into the minutia of our own personal lives 
I guess I'm pointing out that this is like uh, crap through a grease. So they're going to tell us uh, where we can uh, actually go to the bathroom as well. That's the kind of level of control they demand to have over our lives. And they point out from the Competitive in, in, uh, Enterprise Institute, they say this is astonishing. It should be of great concern. It should be intolerable to policymakers. You know what? It should be intolerable to us. And they say, as Obama has promised to regulate by executive authority, we need to tell him that we don't need a phone and a pen. We need a meat axe. That's what Donald uh, Trump needs, a meat axe. Great quote from them. And if you remember, it was a couple of weeks before the election, and it was right after the debate. Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton went to New York, and they did the traditional uh, Al Smith dinner. And Donald Trump made this comment. We have proven that we can actually be civil to each other. In fact, just before taking the dais, Hillary accidentally bumped into me, and she very civilly said, pardon me. And I very politely replied, let me talk to you about that after I get into office. Well, that was a joke, but Jesse Jackson is not joking when he's calling on Obama to pardon Hillary Clinton. What for? She didn't do anything wrong. We've been told for months that Hillary Clinton didn't do anything wrong, even though we had James Comey say, yeah, she committed multiple felonies, but I'm not going to prosecute her. But don't you try this at home. See, that's the double standard that they've established. Remember back in September 30th, and this is the Detroit Free Press talking about this. There was a campaign rally in Michigan, and Donald Trump asked Obama not to pardon Hillary Clinton and her co-conspirators. He said if any charges were filed related to the email scandal. Now, of course, Jesse Jackson is not admitting that she did anything wrong. But remember, Alex Jones talked about this. And he said for three reasons, Donald Trump ought to proceed or allow a, 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 things to go forward in terms of investigating Hillary Clinton and the Clinton Foundation. Number one, he said he would do it. Number two, it's important to restore the integrity of the rule of law in this country and to make sure that we don't have one standard for the important people and another standard for everybody else. And the third reason is just for his own personal survival. Because these people are going to continue to come after him, as we'll see later in the broadcast. Now, uh, Jackson went on to say it would be a monumental moral mistake, he said this today, to pursue the indictment of Hillary Clinton. He said issuing the pardon could help heal the nation, like President Ford's pardon of Richard Nixon did. And I got to tell you, I was a young Republican voter who had voted for Richard Nixon. Yeah, I'm sorry. Made, we all make mistakes, okay? <laughs> and I was absolutely offended when Gerald Ford pardoned Richard Nixon. I thought he should have faced the music. I, we had Spiro Agnew caught, his vice president, caught in his office with a satchel of cash that was so corrupt. No, they should have been investigated thoroughly and they should have been prosecuted. And I was angry at Gerald Ford for doing that. A lot of people were, he didn't get reelected. It didn't heal the nation. What it did was it killed Gerald Ford's political future as it should have. He goes on to say, students are growing up, this is Jesse Jackson now, students are growing up in America that is an identity crisis. You know why they have an identity crisis? It's because of the identity politics of Jesse Jackson and Hillary Clinton and the other Democrats who put this in here, okay? That's the problem. And as I mentioned before, talking about breaking people into tribes, that is the antithesis of Martin Luther King. He said, we need to not judge people by these superficial things that you have no control over. Instead, judge people by the content of their character as individuals. That is the environment that Jesse Jackson and Hillary Clinton have created. Meanwhile, we now have some more people who feel a sense of entitlement. And those are illegal aliens who are also demanding a pardon from Obama. Washington Times points out illegals demand Obama issue mass pardons because they're afraid of deportation fears. Now, let's understand, okay? These people are not undocumented workers. As they point out in the article, they say, illegal immigrants are preparing to ask President Obama to pardon some 750,000 dreamers, okay? Now, if he were to pardon these dreamers for coming into the country illegally, that would be, after the fact, they would still be remaining, they would still be violating the laws because they would still be here ignoring the legal process. And when they call them uh, undocumented workers, as they, and this quote here that they have of the people who are asking for amnesty, the group says millions of law-abiding undocumented immigrants. Think about that, the cognitive dissonance there. 
Millions of law-abiding, undocumented immigrants. Now, that's why they play with the language. What they're saying is millions of law-abiding, illegal foreigners who are here illegally and remain to violate the law should be pardoned. From here to the future, okay? That's the insanity that we have going on here. And the sense of entitlement from people who are not citizens in this country and who thumb their nose at the rules here, demanding to be pardoned, demanding to... Uh, have things given to them. Listen to this part. Young adult illegal immigrants with a two-year stay of deport uh, deportation, which was given to them by the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Think about that. Here's another lie. Childhood Arrivals, DACA, the DACA program. Childhood Arrivals, they can stay for two years and get work permits. We got children working? No, because they're not children. Here's another guy who may be in line for a pardon. Uh, America's top spy, uh, Resigned today, didn't resign, but he says he's not. He's going to retire at the end of the Obama administration. That was James Clapper. And uh, is he going to get a pardon? I don't think he's even asking for one. And of course, uh, uh, you know, he, he's going to leave, but we're going to still have the surveillance state remaining behind. He complained, and this is a long article from Wired Magazine. You know, Wired Magazine has become such a statist magazine for the surveillance state. So Clapper's going to leave, but he's going to leave behind him a surveillance state. And he had this to say, members of Congress wait to ambush me, and they play what I call stump the chump. And in this article, uh, they ask, is spying moral? Well, I would ask, is lying moral when he lied to the Congress and said, no, we're not doing any dragnet surveillance. We all knew that was a lie. And it was proven to us by Ed Snowden's leaks just a few weeks after that. Is violating your oath to the Constitution, is that something that is moral? How about uh, uh, giving the uh, government the authority that it claims to have under the Constitution when it disobeys the Constitution? And it's a very interesting article we don't have time to go into. But they talk about how he came in with the massive violations spying on Americans. That was what the church and the Pike commissions were about. That was what gave us FISA. And they turned it on its head. They inverted it just like they've done the Constitution. We have an illegal surveillance state. Stay with us. We'll be right well, the election was a little over a week ago, but the mechanics of electoral politics is still very much in play. Today, we had Paul Ryan saying, I back Donald Trump's call for term limits. Isn't that interesting? Here's a guy who just got elected to his 10th term. How hypocritical is that? Listen to what he had to say. On Thursday, Paul Ryan said he supports Donald Trump's call for term limits on lawmakers, but the House Speaker stopped short of committing to passing such a bill. <laughs> he said, I have always supported term limits. Always, always. All through my 10 terms, I've supported term limits. He says, I've long been a fan of term limits. So he's a fan of them. <laughs> I don't know where other members stand, but I've always been in favor of that. Now, Donald Trump in mid-October floated an idea of capping House members to three terms or six years in office and senators to two terms or 12 years, okay? And he said at the time, he said the time for congressional term limits has finally arrived. Yes, it has. It has long since arrived for Paul Ryan. And you know, perhaps he could lead by example and say 10 times is plenty. I'm gonna give somebody else a term because I may have been here so long, I might have been corrupted by the power. I might be part of the problem. Yes, I think you are part of the problem, Paul Ryan, and I think your hypocrisy, your glaring hypocrisy on this is uh, what we've seen with your uh, campaigning to do something about Obamacare, to do something about the open borders, failing to stand up to Obama as he took over your job and did uh, executive orders, creating the legislation when you wouldn't do it and you didn't do any checks and balances on him. Yeah, we need a check and balance. We really do need term limits. Now, also, the Electoral College has been examined quite a bit. It's part of the Soros tactic of trying to delegitimize the election as they want to also make Donald Trump look authoritarian. And we're going to talk about that in the next segment with Wayne Madsen. The, what we're seeing here is a pattern of color revolutions that we've seen throughout uh, Europe led by Soros and his NGOs. So we're going to talk to him in the next segment about that. But take a look first at uh, this individual. Michael Baca, a Democrat elector from Denver, Colorado, saying that there ought to be a revolution from the people being sent to the Electoral College that they should not vote uh, for Donald Trump. And it's like, well, wait a minute, here's a reality check. Colorado, it was not won by Trump. So they're not going to have any Republican electors going to uh, Washington. But he is hoping that uh, he can get people who are on the other side 
uh, to not vote for him, even though there's not any Republican electors that will be going from Colorado. You understand that when someone wins the state, each party has a full slate of electors. So there's a slate of Republican electors. If they got a dozen people that are a dozen electoral votes, they'll have 12 Democrats. They'll also have a list of 12 Republicans. And this is how the process is going to work. I'll tell you in just a moment. But this is what he had to say, which is really amazing. He says he's working to persuade Republican electors in other states to support a different candidate. What kind of candidates would that be? Well, he says, well, how about uh, Gary Johnson or Evan McMullen or even John Kasich or Mitt Romney? Nobody supported them at all. What we're seeing again is the same tactic they tried coming up to the nominating convention. It didn't work then. It's not going to work now. And the interesting point as they're talking about this, it's been pointed out that the last time there was a faithless elector, and as I point out, they, they've tried, they put their hopes in illegals to win the election. Now they're putting their hopes in the faithless to win the electoral college election. But the last time this happened was in 2004. And instead of voting for John Kerry, Someone, and I believe it was in Colorado, voted actually for John Edwards. See, what happens is usually it's the losing side where people defect because they're upset about the losers. And in this particular case, I think this year, if there's going to be any defectors from the election, I think they're going to defect from the Democrat Party. I would fully expect for Democrats to not vote for Hillary Clinton, but to vote for Bernie Sanders because they're fed up with the corruption of the DNC as represented by HRC, Hillary Rodham Clinton. Now, when is this all going to happen? Uh, you've heard a lot about it. Well, when it's going to happen, they say the first Monday after the second Wednesday. That's the way we do stuff here. After the second Wednesday of December. In other words, December 19th this year. Why they define it that way, I don't know. And then on January the 6th, Congress will meet in a joint session, count the electoral votes. If no candidate gets 270 or more electoral votes, then the House of Representatives will decide who will be president. See, that's why I think Donald Trump is not getting too rough with Paul Ryan or with Reince Priebus. Because Reince Priebus can keep the Republican Party in line, the Electoral College. And then even if that didn't happen, it isn't going to uh, get past the Republican House. So there's absolutely not a chance that Donald Trump isn't going to be elected. Sorry, uh, all you social justice warriors who are cutting yourselves and whining in the streets. Now, trade secreters uh, from the predictors who called a Trump victory is the title of an article from Politico. They're looking at this and saying, how did we miss this and how did these people get it right? Now, of course, they're not going to give any apologies or any credit to InfoWars for running story after story, reporting and talking to these same people that they dismissed as delusional. OK, the one of the people that they talked to, of course, is Helmut Norpoth. Uh, from Stony Brook, political science professor. We've had four or five articles from him uh, at InfoWars. We've had uh, uh, Drudge uh, uh, link our articles about him and other metrics that people could use. As they point out in the subtitle of this article, shy voters, what the media ignored, and other lessons from the few who got it right and were laughed at. They said just about everybody blew the call. Well, not everyone, they say. There were some people who got it right, whether by quirk or polling, a model relied more on history, or by sheer accident. No, it wasn't any sheer accident. There were a lot of metrics that you chose to ignore and you listened to yourselves. Now, I recorded this earlier, and this, I think, is a very interesting tale uh, about Donald Trump. A tale of two cities, one in New York and another in Russia. This is an interesting story of two cities, one in New York and one in Russia. And, of course, two petitions, reactions, both of them, to President-elect Donald Trump. Now, you've probably seen that in New York there was a petition floating around. There were three apartment buildings, a complex of three apartment buildings in New York that was called Trump Place. They sent a petition around and they changed the name. They wanted to have Trump Place removed. And it's kind of interesting when you look at this, as they're beginning to take the letters down, they take down the T first, and it is Rump Place, which perhaps describes the residents there better than anything else. But maybe they could change it to President place. How about that? that? That's a suggestion for him. Now we get a very different uh, reaction in Russia. We have residents of a Russian town, Razan, that want to change the name of a street. They want to name it after Donald Trump. Isn't that interesting? So you got people in New York taking Trump's name off of a building, and in Russia, they want to name a street after him. Now it gets even more interesting. The current name of the street in Russia is Godless. Why would anybody name a street godless? Well, communists would, because they're atheists. Because if you know anything about the communist revolution, what they did first was to take over all the churches, change them into museums, try to purge religion out of everywhere. 
Oh, it kind of sounds like the people running New York now, doesn't it? But the other thing that's interesting is there's not one street in Razan that's named Godless, but two streets with the same name. They liked Godless so much that they named it twice. And what's even more interesting, they said, even though the people are signing this petition, they don't think that the name is going to be changed because they only change the names after somebody dies. So was that an admission by the communists that God existed, saying that, well, God is dead now? Actually, if he existed, he would never be dead. But that's another story. Uh, it's, it reminds me of what happened when President Obama became president. Shortly after he became president, he was given the Nobel Peace Prize. Nobody knew what he was going to do. And here we have a president who locked up more journalists and whistleblowers than all the presidents before him between 1917, when they passed the Espionage Act, until Obama. He locked up more people than all those presidents before him after 1917, combined, combined. This is a guy who is at war with seven different countries. He's thrown one regime after the other, overthrown them, going in and creating massive wars in Syria that have created a refugee crisis that they tell us now we need to bring these people in or we're the bad guys. Yeah, we were the bad guys when we started the war. The Russians are looking at this. I just talked to uh, Zargrad TV two days ago. They uh, wanted to get our comments about the election because people over there are actually more excited about the possibility of Donald Trump being president than Americans are because they understand the devastation of war. They are not that far removed from World War II where tens of millions of people died during that war, where cities were devastated. They take the threat of war very seriously, unlike Americans in New York. The people of Russia feel a great burden has been lifted off of them. We've had the Nobel Peace Prize winner Barack Obama threatening to start a war for a long time. And of course, they know that the warmonger Hillary would be even more threatening than Barack Obama. So they've had this this burden taken off of them. And at the same time, I think it's interesting that they have rejected the godlessness of atheism while we see those in the Democrat camp moving towards godless atheism, like in New York. Stay with us. When we come back, we're going to talk to Wayne Madsen about George Soros's new color revolution. Will it be purple? Joining me now is Wayne Madsen, InfoWars correspondent and, of course, publisher of the Wayne Madsen Report. I want to talk to Wayne about what we see in terms of the reactions to this election. We have to understand, this is something that is far deeper, far more orchestrated than simply the reactions of a lot of spoiled millennials, social justice warriors out there. This has all the hallmarks of a George Soros color revolution. And to break that down for us is Wayne Madsen. Thank you, Wayne. Hi, good to be with you. Um, yeah, if you, look, if you look at the history of these color or themed revolutions, uh, you, you see that uh, in many countries, including Ukraine, um, twice, uh, where uh, Viktor Yanukovych was elected in 2004, and he was elected again uh, later, uh, immediately the Soros people, through his Open uh, Society Institute and Foundation, and associated groups like the National Endowment for Democracy, which is nothing more than a cipher for the CIA, began uh, street demonstrations, massive street demonstrations uh, that in, in both cases uh, in Ukraine resulted in the overthrow of the duly elected government. Uh, yeah, he admitted yeah. to funding, uh, to, to financing the uh, Maiden Square Revolution 2013-2014. That's right, and he also funded the 2004 uh, uh, revolution, uh, the Orange Revolution in Ukraine. Uh, in 2004, uh, which saw this guy, um, uh, Viktor Yushchenko, uh, who did not win that election, actually becoming the president, uh, yeah. even though Yanukovych won. The first uh, recorded is, uh, incident of a themed revolution was in the 90s, again, uh, funded with Soros money, called the Bulldozer Revolution against Slobodan Milosevic. Mm -hmm. in what was then uh, rump Yugoslavia, what was left of that country. And we saw it play out again. I, I said in Ukraine, we saw the Rose Revolution in Georgia that put this guy Saakashvili in power, another Soros acolyte. Uh, we've seen uh, similar revolutions. The Arab Spring, uh, for example, uh, the Jasmine Revolution in Tunisia, the Lotus Revolution in Egypt, uh, all these, the Green Revolution, which was aborted in Iran, 
cedar revolution, another failed revolution in Lebanon, the olive tree revolution, a failed attempt in Palestine, goes on and on. Uh, and then there were attempts in Russia, the white revolution. And right now, uh, China has cracked down on an attempted uh, uh, revolution to, to, uh, for Hong Kong to become independent called the Umbrella Revolution. So, so they love to seize on a... Yeah, they love to... We got this pattern here where they love to seize on a color. It's typically done with students, typically done with funding from uh, the U.S., uh, CIA, whatever, but also with non-governmental organizations that are run by George Soros. They like to pick these colors and everything. And we also see, don't we... Uh, Wayne, a pattern where they come out and they question the legitimacy of an election. We got all these people out there saying, oh, it's the Electoral College. Oh, she won the popular vote, but this Electoral College is going to put him in. That's their subtle way of planting that seed. Well, it's not quite legitimate. And then the other side of that is they revolt against somebody that they paint as authoritarian. So you see both of these tactics being put out against Donald Trump at this point in time, don't you? Yeah, and, and the day after the election, the morning after when Hillary and Bill Clinton came out uh, at the uh, New Yorker Hotel before the, the, her concession speech. You saw Bill Clinton wearing a purple tie. You saw Hillary wearing a sort of purple lapels and a purple blouse. And, and, and a, a bunch of the reporters there said, hey, what's going on? What's this? And the spokespeople for the Clintons put the word out, well, that's a coming together of blue America and red America. You have purple America. <laughs> I didn't buy it. I said, there's something going on here. <laughs> these Clintons. And, then, and sure enough, we saw um, these uh, demonstrations break out. And someone alerted me, uh, somebody that reads my website alerted me and said, look, well, here's the uh, pictures of those arrested in Portland, Oregon. And uh, several of these mug shots, the people were wearing some sort of purple something, a purple shirt, a purple scarf. Uh, but uh, it was quite clear that uh, we were uh, entering, uh, we were getting a taste of our own medicine, in this case, a purple revolution. Yeah, we look at this and the tactics, like I pointed out, Soros' involvement, funding it, the uh, questioning of the leg legitimacy of the election, the authoritarian claims. And so I wonder what color this is going to be. Will it be black? Will it be rainbow? <laughs> he pointed out, hey, it'd probably be purple. And we've seen Obama putting out the narrative continually, even as he's meeting with Merkel. Hey, we've got we've to understand you can't just do this alone. We need to have concession. We need to have compromise. We all need to come together. That's the way they're going to put this out there. Have we ever heard that from Barack Obama throughout his administration? Absolutely not. He would come out and say, I'm, I'm not going to wait for Congress to ratify or the Senate to ratify this treaty, this Paris Accord, or I don't want to wait for them to do this, or I tried to get them to do that. I'm just going to do it by executive order. I don't really care what Congress says. So they've never been about compromise. They've never been about building a consensus. And yet that's their pushback to say, hey, you don't really have any authority to govern. And if you do push back and you do follow the mandate and the agenda and, and work on the issues that people elected you to do, we're going to say you're authoritarian. Yeah, we certainly see Obama doing that overseas right now in Germany with Angela Merkel uh, hyping up the EU and, and NATO. He was in Greece with the prime minister there, uh, again, hyping up uh, all these uh, international organizations. That At the same time, we see uh, uh, Russia withdrawing from the International Criminal Court. Philippines may follow. There, there, and we, the Brexit, he was also uh, kind of like uh, when he was with Merkel saying, well, we want to see uh, a, a smooth uh, a Brexit. Um, it, you know, it's clear that what Obama is doing now in this last trip, he's trying to shore up these uh, globalist contrivances like the EU, NATO, the International Criminal Court, and, and, his, mm -hmm. and these failing trade programs. He mentioned uh, the transatlantic uh, trade agreement, which is basically dead on arrival, and the and the uh, uh, really uh, very ill uh, Trans-Pacific partnership. Yeah, well, they they pronounced that as dead, and I thought it was interesting that they waited until after the election to pronounce that dead. We were told by the mainstream media, hey. There's one thing that the two of them agree on, and that is TPP isn't going to go through. Well, if that was the case, then they could have said before the election that TPP was dead. But they waited until after the election because they knew that if Hillary had been elected, TPP would have gone through. But I want to finish up with one last thing and, and get your comment on this. 
In a Free Thought article talking about George Soros's connection, pointing out the fact that his Open Society uh, Foundation was uh, calling on people to organize in these various cities, putting themselves at the center of this, organizing this. They also pointed out that in the WikiLeaks uh, emails, uh, Hillary Clinton, that they put in their archives, we can see that George Soros and Hillary Clinton were talking about things that needed to be done in Albania. George Soros said to Hillary Clinton, two things need to be done urgently. We need to bring the full weight of the international community to bear on the prime minister there. We need to appoint a senior European official as mediator. And then he told Hillary Clinton three people that would be acceptable to him. He is the puppet master. He has used Hillary Clinton before, and we should be very aware of these, this history as they try to gaslight this and say, oh, you're just conspiracy theorists. No, we've seen the historical pattern of the way Soros has operated for a couple of decades, at least uh, more than two decades, probably, and then Hillary Clinton more recently. Yeah, I would like to see President Trump uh, look at uh, applying the Logan Act from the late uh, 18th century uh, which was an act, uh, uh, a law which forbids uh, U.S. citizens from engaging in their own private foreign policies. Now, yes. it's questionable whether uh, when, when uh, Clinton was Secretary of State and Obama, you know, uh, that they weren't like uh, authorizing uh, Soros. But I, I, that would be very, very hard to prove under, under Trump, who, who's, you know, basically saying we need to disengage from a lot of uh, this type of stuff overseas. And, and uh, there have been some attempts to implement uh, or at least uh, bring into force the Logan Act against individuals. But it would be, I, I think Soros is one of the reasons why they, those founders uh, passed the Logan Act. They were trying to prevent private citizens from getting, right. for example, the U.S. involved well, in the war. You yeah, know? We're, we're about out of time, but you're absolutely right. And I, I think we ought to see some of the people who are powerful, like CEOs and Hollywood executives who call for violence, say we need to fund violence, we need to assassinate Trump. They need to be treated like the same way that they're treating uh, people who tweet that stuff out from their mom's basement. Thank you so much yeah. for joining us, Wayne Madsen, Wayne Madsen Report, and a frequent InfoWars correspondent. Thank you so much for joining us today. You bet. Owen Schroyer here, joined by Margaret Howell. And today, one of the stories that we were covering on The Alex Jones Show and at Infowars.com was, of course, Quancast blacklisting Infowars as fake news. <laughs> we have pop-ups with certain uh, downloads you can bring on to your browser that will warn you when you go to Infowars.com and other sites that it is fake news. This was a app developed that uh, will target us based on a list that comes from a liberal professor out of Massachusetts or out of Merrimack College, actually, who I tried to reach out to her today, and she's uh, she's tough to reach. Melissa or Misha? Mish is Mish. what it is. Zimdars, Professor Zimdars. I tried to reach out to her today, could not get through. She's hard to reach. Her tweets are protected. You can't see those. Um, but she made this list, and now we're on it as fake news. So we're going to continue to follow that. I'm trying to reach out to uh, that professor to see if she'll tell us what we do exactly that's fake. Don't you think or we perhaps work, I'm fake. No, I'm actually here. We work really here. hard for fake news, let me just tell you. We spend hours upon hours <laughs> researching, quote, fake news. Really well, we'll see if they want to comment on why we're on a list of fake news, but unable to get a hold of Professor Zimdars, who made the list. But now it's being admitted. Now, this is a funny story out of BuzzFeed. Viral fake election news outperformed real news on Facebook in final months of U.S. elections. So basically what this is, is they're admitting that we are winning. Thank you for admitting that we are winning. The top performing fake election news stories, Infowars, on Facebook generated more engagement than top stories from major news outlets such as New York Times, Washington Post, HuffPost, NBC News, and others. Oh, wow, really? People don't want to go to NBC News that had Brian Williams on the air lying about what happened when he um, was apparently, I guess, under fire, was it? What, what story did he make up, Margaret? You know, that didn't seem to hurt his career at all. Because well, he's on MSNBC he, now, yeah. so that's good for him. Good for him. Look, the BuzzFeed people aren't even good enough to be on the uh, their own, you know, legitimate news site when they're quoting legitimate news. <laughs> well, they are on the front page of Quantcast.com, who apparently <laughs> uh, blacklist us because we're fake news. But this comes from Brendan Nyhan, a 
political science professor at Dartmouth. I'm troubled that Facebook is doing so little to combat fake news. Uh, they want to shut us down? <laughs> Even if they did not swing the election, the evidence is clear that bogus stories have incredible reach on the network. Facebook should be fighting misinformation, not amplifying it. Uh, BuzzFeed is getting beaten by InfoWars and we don't know what to do. You know, but here's the thing about me. First of all, so this is this crying? is this Are you is, crying over here really? <laughs> What's that? Liberal tears here. No, but this is first of all, this is very anti First Amendment. I never call for them to be shut down. I'm I sure call, you do. I, no, we do. No, we do. I we do. Well, we I don't. Fun. I just I just oh, I just God. confront them head on with with facts and knowledge and political discourse right. and debate. But they won't have see, but here's the thing though, they're not gonna have me on CNN or NBC. They can't they can't afford that. Right. Because that'll shatter their matrix. Does anybody watch CNN anymore? Unless you're like walking through an airport and you're forced to? The Alex Jones 52 hour coverage had, uh, when they announced that Trump won has over a million views. I doubt anyone from CNN has a million views announcing that Donald Trump won. That's true. So, so we have a lot, and we've got this up too, and we need to point this out because this really, you like this. I personally, Mr. Brown, uh, might put you on a on a slander. Well, Jennings Brown from here. New York Mag show wrote this Twitter story. Handle or should we do the story first? Infowars Alex Jones, king of all trolls, relishes his moment now. They call us a team of crackpot reporters mm -hmm. in this story, and this actually has Maggie very very upset. <laughs> well, only because you know he's he's linked to our Twitter. First of all, no direct quotes in here. It's all rifting. And then you come down and he's listed all of us and in a very defamatory way. And he says that we provide relief for when Alex is speaking. And then he, he links all, you like it. Yeah, I don't mind it. This guy, uh, I never heard of him before in, in terms of a journalistic standpoint. Well, here's the difference. I've never heard of Quantcast. I've never heard of any of these people. This is probably just a desperate plea for attention yeah. as much as anything else. Because you got us talking about you. Exactly. Yeah. So congratulations, you successfully congratulations. trolled me. But here's, the, but here's the thing for me. Oh, there's Jennings 1683, Brown. 1683. The Bernie, I mean, the Bernie Sanders Illuminati. 2009. Background there. I don't the know what that is. Bernie might run in the, uh, or at least has hinted he might run at the next uh, presidential election. But again, here's the difference. Here's why I don't mind it, Margaret, is because I am not afraid of these people. I don't need to shut their free speech down. Okay, yes, it's propaganda. Yes, it's the misinformation. But what do we do? We respond to it in real time. Mm -hmm. We actually engage in political discourse. We actually want to fight the information war with ideas and thoughts and logic and philosophy. We don't, I mean, you want them shut down for obvious reasons. Well, I mean, it's, they're it's, engaged in treason and misinformation. I, you know, we really love Americans here. We do. I know you do. You true patriots, we, we love humanity. We love our fellow man. And we do this out of love and respect for you and out of love and respect for our nation. And I really don't like when some jackass, I don't know if I can say that on, on, on our- You're being kind. Okay, so I, I don't like it when, you know, we have to be labeled as fake or idiots or, you know, our, our emotional stability. Crackpot is a word, it's a, it's a coin term that's typically geared towards women with emotional issues. You know, that's the best he has right there, uh, talking about our marathon coverage and his team of pundits. Which one of us is a pundit versus reporter? You know, we all work our tails off around here, bringing you up to date, real time information, the most true sources we can find. You know, in in house, we really do due diligence here. And for somebody to write something like that, and then you pull up his picture, we were talking off camera about, you know, just the facial expressions of this guy. Um, I well, don't I don't know what, what we were. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to get, we don't need to talk about what, what, right, what kind of a person fine. he looks like. But what is, here's, here's what I find funny. And this is why I tried to reach out to Professor Zimdars, who puts mm -hmm. us on the fake news list. I just want to know, what is it I do that's fake? Okay, because all I have, I have, I have news stories that I have here in front of me that somebody has vetted, somebody has researched. And we're going to talk about what is actually fake news. But I mean, most of the time, I'm not even generating news. Mm -hmm. I mean, very, very, you know, seldomly am I actually breaking some news. Our writers might do that here in the back, but usually I'm just mm -hmm. reporting on news or government activity. So I don't understand what is fake news. What's actually going on is that our ideas, our philosophies, our logic has completely trumped theirs. It's completely defeated theirs. This election cycle is the culmination of their ultimate defeat. 
And so this is their response to try to shut us down, to try to silence us, to try to name call us, fake news, whatever it is. And this is their response. And I imagine it's going to continue. It looks like this is the trend now, Margaret. Right. Race based everything to create a race war. Oh and my then gosh. fake news, fake news, fake news. We'd, and the government have, decides what's real. Trump couldn't have taken this election. Or Professor Zimdars. Without the minority vote. You know, people really, right. it is so insulting to minorities to, you know, to paint them. In, 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 they have to be of, of one political party. They couldn't possibly have had a hand in the outcome of this election. It is so physically sickening. Uh, to hear the race baiting that's happening with mainstream media news reporters. And I, I love this article. Facebook fake news writer, I thought Donald Trump is in the White House because of me. Well, and this uh, is what's happening. Okay. This is actual fake news. This guy, Paul Horner, he's 38 years old. And he did an interview with the Washington Post and the New York Post. And of course, this is extremely timely. <laughs> right. Because here's what they're going to do. So this is an actual fake news site, folks. This guy, it's NBC.com.co. And again, it, you know, we understand we're giving them the publicity, but we have to confront this because after all, I guess I'm a fake reporter. <laughs> but nonetheless, what they we've do is they try to... a long time to be fake reporters. <laughs> I mean, years of toil and sweat. You know, you think you'd give up the jig if it were fake by now. But. They try to pretend they're real. So they basically try to mirror their site and appear to be NBC. Right. And they'll write fake headlines and write fake stories. And it's actual fake news. They admit it. They say, yes, we are totally <laughs> fake. And then you can tell, you know, you read the headlines. It doesn't take long to figure that out. You read the story. But as Paul Horner points out, most Americans are dumb enough that they actually believe it. So this is actual fake news. But what they're going to do is they're going to put... Infowars, Drudge Report, Breitbart, they're going to lump, lump all of these into the same list of fake news right. of people who are actually out there engaging in fake news to try to prove a point that Americans will read anything and believe it against people like Infowars and Breitbart who are reporting things that the mainstream news has ignored and that is deemed as conspiracy theory. So this is how it's going to work. Lump us in with actual fake news. We are the real news, folks, and we will be back Tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Central, InfoWars Nightly News. Thank you, Margaret Owen-Schroyer, signing off.